everyone. My name is Jessica Poros, and I am the Senior Manager for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. It is my pleasure to, to welcome you today to our market-based review training webinar, which will provide a general overview as well as a live demonstration of the MBR submission process. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few logistical items. You can download a copy of today's presentation from the CAQH.org website. To do, to do so, Navigate to the core pull-down menu at the top of the CAQH.org welcome screen and select the core education events page. A link to the PDF version of the presentation can be found under the listing for today's webinar. On this slide, you can see a screenshot of the attendee GoToWebinar dashboard. You should see something that looks similar to this on the right side of your computer desktop. When joining today's session, if possible, you may have joined the audio portion of the webinar using your computer speakers by default. If possible, we would prefer you to join the webinar audio by telephone. To do this, please select the telephone audio button in the audio panel of your dashboard, and the dial-in information will be displayed. Make sure you enter your audio PIN, which is found under your dial-in information. We will save time at the end of today's program dedicated to responding to audience questions. You're encouraged to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. We ask that when you submit your questions, you please identify your type of organization uh, that you're with so we can give you a more accurate response. So today we will begin with two presentations. The first one on the core code combination maintenance process, and then the second presentation will be on the core market-based review. We will then do a live demonstration of parts one and two of the MBR so you can become familiar with the process and also during the demo you Jessica, I'm not sure. I can't hear anything from your location. It appears we are having some technical difficulties. Please stand by for just a moment. Oh. I can hear you guys now. Yeah, Bob is talking. No. Are we ready? Going to another. Hi, Bob. We can hear you. We're ready, Bob. Sorry for the technical okay. difficulties. Apologies. Well, thanks, Jessica, for setting this up for the today's presentation. We do want to start with um, exactly what the maintenance process is, with a quick overview. And on the next slide, if we can go to that slide, you'll see that the phase three rule for the uniform use of the CARCs and RARCs is part of a larger set of the phase three rule, but it's specific to the data content of the 835 transaction. So it's very important that um, health plans use the codes in a consistent way to provide messaging to their providers um, on exactly how they adjudicated the claim. So on the next slide, you'll see that um, from a potential uh, set of hundreds of thousands of code combinations that providers may have to uh, consume from health plans with a very specific maintenance process applied to them with four common business scenarios, you come away with a very streamlined code set that is very usable by the provider community. And so that helps mitigate lots of problems that the providers have if you have such a large, cumbersome code set or potential code combinations. Um, it helps remove um, unnecessary manual provider follow-up so they don't have to reach out to a health plan via phone or via a website to understand exactly what a, a code combination might mean. It also helps with a lot of billing problems that providers experience. Um, the secondary billing process is, is, uh, is made much easier. Uh, particular write-offs of billed charges and patient co-pays and deductibles are, are more easily understood and therefore it can be easier to be applied to a provider's AR. 
Um, and also with a streamlined code set, you remove um, posting delays or barriers to delaying the EFT and the ERA to that particular patient's um, AR record. On the next slide, you'll see that um, there are, again, very specific benefits for the providers. Again, the potential reduction in the manual claim rework, again, with a very consistent set of use of the denial and adjustment codes with the core defined business scenarios. Providers have much less rework to do, and they can more automate that payment posting process that they have on the member's AR. Uh, the improved denial management is also very helpful for providers. Again, once they understand exactly how all of the health plans are making an adjustment or a denial to a particular claim or a line in a claim, um, once it becomes uniform from all payers, it becomes uniform for all payers. It makes it a lot easier for the providers to understand that those types of denials and adjustments. Uh, again, we mentioned that it improves collections. It most definitely can because it helps the providers to um, rebuild. It helps providers to generate crossover claims. It helps them um, reduce open accounts receivable much more expeditiously, very, very quickly because everything is much better understood coming from the health plan. There's reduction in cost to collect as well. Again, if we can save time, energy, and money in, in, in ensuring we can better auto-post the payment as well as the remittance advice information, it makes it much easier for the providers uh, to, to do that process. It reduces their cost to collect as well. And last but not least, the aggregated data, data analysis is very important because, again, it allows for the industry to look at how providers are receiving the data, how they can better auto post, how they can better generate secondary bills, how they can better um, manage their AR transactions. And it helps the industry look at the process for where are the most common problems and issues that providers still face when receiving code combinations. And one that we'll be tackling probably in 2016 quite, quite a bit is the different types of attachments, the attachment problems um, that providers experience. With a better set of code combinations, explaining exactly what the issues are allows the providers to focus on what's the next level of issues that they experience. So with the um, review process that we have in place on the next slide, you'll see that we have two different processes set up for our four business scenarios. The first one um, is specific to the compliance-based review, and those occur three times per year. Again, these are triggered by the triannual update. So the CARC list and the RARC list is updated three times per year. So CAQH Core goes through a compliance-based review three times per year. We did just complete our CBR in July 1st with an updated set um, of code combinations that was published to our website on October uh, 1st of this year. So those are out and available for use, and entities should be com in compliance with those by January 1st. Um, the one the, the review that we're specifically talking about this afternoon is the annual market-based review. Again, this occurs once per year and is based specifically on the entire industry can submit adjustments to the core code combinations based on specific business needs. So you can add code combinations, you can remove code combinations, and you can also request to have code combinations relocated from one business scenario to another. And all of this is specific to your usage of the code combination. So if you are still experiencing problems and issues, now is the time as a market, as the industry, to address those issues through the market-based review process. So we'll be walking through that process through much of the rest of the call today, so make sure that you understand that. And my colleague Omni will be going through a demo in just a moment. But um, on the next slide, really to make sure that we understand where all of this comes from and where all the work comes out of um, is our core code combination task group. This task group's mission is to these core code combinations and our business scenarios. And it's composed of over 40 different core participating organizations from a wide variety of stakeholders. And it does include four chairs, um, both from um, a provider from the UW Medicine. We have two health plans represented under Aetna and United, as well as a vendor, um, Janice Cunningham from Relay, for example, uh, represents uh, our vendor community. So the four co-chairs help manage this process. Uh, it's a cyclical process, it's ongoing, and it, this is a maintenance process that really was defined and supported by the rule itself. 
So with that, I'll hand the call over to Tyler to uh, uh, work through our first polling question. Tyler? Thank you very much, Bob. And again, we apologize for earlier in the webinar for that slight malfunction. We have got everything working and up to speed here. Um, I'm going to begin with the first of two polling questions we have this afternoon. The first question we ask, does your organization intend to submit a request for market-based adjustments to the core code combinations? I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll question. We'll give you about 30 to 40 seconds to give us an answer, and then we'll share the results with you. We'll go ahead and launch that now. We'll give it about 15 more seconds. Okay, thank you for everybody who has voted. I'm going to go ahead and close that and share those results with you now. As you can see, we do have a large majority of the audience here that's unsure or to be determined if you will submit. We do encourage you to reach out to our team at core at thqh.org. If you have any questions whatsoever, if something seems unclear, please, um, no question is too small, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be happy to assist you in the process. Uh, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and hide the results. And Bob, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to you for the remainder of your presentation. Great. Thank you, Tyler. And really what we want to do next over the next couple of slides is really just provide you the basics for the market-based review, walk through what the process is, and also the scope, what, what's contained within this market-based review. And hopefully that will clear up any um, concerns you may have or questions or uh, maybe even help you determine if you wish to submit um, a submission for this year's market-based review. So again, the basic information includes that the 2015 MPR was launched on December 10th of this year, so just last week. And it is a 60-day open period where the industry can make submissions to the MBR. So you have 60 days all the way until February 10th. And the code combinations, the task group, as I mentioned before, will come together after that February date and work through all of the submissions that come through. And they'll evaluate them, vote on them, and they have lots of discussions around them to see if they should be um, included or not in that publication. And the next publication that would include any adjustments for this market-based review would be June in 2016. So it is a, a, a long process, but we make sure that that process is very sound to, to make sure that the co commissions are also very sound. So again, adjustments must be requested using the latest version of the code combinations, and we do include those. Again, those are published in October. So the base on that set. So you can add, remove, or relocate codes from that set. It's also going to be very important for you to understand some of the key terms as you walk through the market-based review. And when Omni goes through the live demo of the site, the form that you'll use to complete, these are going to be important as well. So remember, the first key term is an entry. It's a single code addition, removal, or relocation. And any supporting information that you include on the form, so that's one entry. Supporting information is also important, and that is that the, it's any additional information requested on the form for each entry. And as an example, we request from the industry to include evaluation criteria, a business case, and any real-world usage data to help support your submission. So if you wish to have a code combination removed from the set, it's great to include that evaluation criteria information, your business case, to make sure that it makes sense to other folks as they evaluate uh, your submission. Same with an addition. If you wish to add codes, it's great to have that real-world usage data. Perhaps you use this code quite a bit, or you'd like to see this code used more. Putting that information in the real-world usage data section is very helpful as the code is evaluated. Last but not least is submission. The entire completion, when you've put in all of your information, the in, that, that 
um, entire set of information, it becomes your submission. So all of your code additions, your removals, your relocations, everything is included. That is considered a submission. So you all have your entries with all their supporting information, and then your submission is all of your requests. So it's including all your additions, all your removals, and all your relocations. So enough for the uh, dictionary definitions for the terms that you're going to see. Uh, we do want to get into some uh, more of the actual process. So the eligible submitters are really any core or non-core participating organizations that create, use, or transmit the HIPAA covered transaction. You can submit a market-based review. Um, and that really means anyone within the industry that touches an 835, uses this information, can, have, can submit on the market-based review. Um, we do limit it to one submission per um, entity, so you may have to coordinate with your colleagues if you're from a large health plan, for example, or large hospital system. Um, we do want just one submission from one entity for evaluation. Um, again, how to submit the information, we do have a link here. There's a link um, on our website as well, and we'll share that information with you uh, in just uh, at the end as well. Um, we'll be sending out reminders to the industry uh, via an email. So this link will take you directly to the market-based form where you can begin your submission process. Again, with that being said, we will only accept um, entries from the online market-based form. So we will not be able to accept email or uh, fax or uh, any other type of submission, but only from the online tool. Again, you can submit these beginning now all the way until February 10th. So we do want to make sure uh, we give the industry 60 days, a lot of time, plenty of time for you to evaluate um, the hard billing problems that you as a provider may be seeing. Or if you're a, health, a representative from a health plan, if you are getting lots of calls from providers on specific code combinations, perhaps these are ones that need to be included in the four business scenarios that currently exist or removed from them if it's causing confusion for your provider community. On the next slide, you'll see that um, really the, the scope of the market-based review, there is a variance from one year to the next in this, for this particular case and reason. So I do want to kind of make sure you understand this. Um, last year, we had our first formal call for potential new business scenarios. This wasn't just adding a code or removing a code. This was the potential of actually adding entire new business scenario with a bunch of codes underneath it. So we, the, the industry had a number of submissions. We had five submissions. And this year, from the evaluation of those five submissions, the task group um, did review them. Um, it felt that none of the ones that we received last year met the evaluation criteria to make an adjustment to the core code combination. So with that understanding, there's definitely a need for, um, or maybe a future business need to request new core defined business scenarios. The task group is going to actually outline a process to add new business scenarios into the existing core code combinations maintenance process. So the 2016 MBR will include um, a second call for potential new Core, I'm sorry, new core defined business scenarios. The 2015, this year's, does not. There was not an evaluation. Uh, there are none of them from last year met their evaluation criteria. So they decided to remove that process this year and adjust the process to make sure we can in, ensure that they meet all of the requirements and, and have that open period for next year in the 2016 and beyond. If we move on to the next slide, continue our, our uh, conversation of the scope of the rule, there are a number of types of adjustments that can be submitted. And so we do have these in three different types of adjustments. There's different types of additions, different types of removals, and different types of relocation. And all of these are possible. And the online tool allows you to select addition, removal, and relocation, and then what type you would like to do. So you can add carts and RARTs. You can remove just a group code. You can relocate all of the carts and RARTs and group codes from one business scenario into another. So any type of variety or any change that you feel that should be made to the existing set of core code combinations can be requested and supported. Um, with that, um, I believe we'll go on to our next, uh, I'm sorry, pass on to Omni for our actual live demo. So Omni? Great, thanks, Bob. So 
So for the live demo, what we're going to do is first take you to the EAQH website where you can access the link to the online form, and then we'll proceed through the actual form. So as you can see on the website, we do have a special page dedicated to the core code combinations and the maintenance of them. The page on the website is here. Sorry, we're just doing some navigating of different pages and such again. So on this page, if you scroll down to the very bottom, you have an accordion menu of different, excuse me, of different options. And you want to submit how to go, I'm sorry, you want to select how to submit market-based adjustments. So if you click on this and it expands, there is a link to the online form, to part one of the online form on the website. There is also a link in the presentation that you're receiving today, but if you have an, a future need to be able to access the form, or for individuals not on today's webinar, there is the direct link to the survey on the website. So when you click on the form link, it will take you to here, part one of the survey. The survey, again, does have two parts. Part one is where you register, and part two is where you submit potential market-based adjustments. There is no direct link to part two publicly available because each organization that registers will receive a unique link specific to your organization and to the individual that we registered, which I'll speak to in a, in a moment. And that unique link is for your organization to access and enter all of the submit, submitted market-based adjustments that you want the task group to consider. So we'll go ahead and complete part one now. The first section in part one provides a brief overview of the background, scope, and introduction to the form to, to the survey. You'll note, as Bob just spoke to, the 2015 market-based review is specific to adjustments to the existing core defined business scenarios. So there are three types of adjustments that can be applied, as Bob mentioned. We can add CARCs and MARCs and group codes. We can remove CARCs or MARCs or group codes. And then you can request to take a code combination, either a CARC and a group code or a CARC MARC and a group code, from an existing business scenario and move that to another business scenario. So perhaps your organization has experienced that CARC 250 really belongs in business scenario three and it's in business scenario number one. That would not be a real example. <laughs> um, but then if you feel that those should be moved, you can go ahead and submit that request. And so there is also a direct link to the core code combinations there on the web page to the current version in case you need to access it. So the next section, of the next page in section one of the survey just provides an overview to the structure and format of the survey. Um, we also have some resources that can assist with submitting a response to the survey. There's the sample version of the form is available, so we do encourage you to access this sample version of the form. It has an example of how the addition, the relocation, the removal, and that will enable you to prepare your response in advance of this, of completing the online form. Additionally, at linked in the presentation are some instructions, and we do have several FAQs specific to the market-based review. So the table in section one under instructions provides kind of a nice level set or overview of each of the subsections and the different parts of the survey, whether completion of information in that section is required or mandatory and kind of how to step-by-step step complete each section. So for example, as we'll see in a minute with section 3A, where you enter the codes that you want to add, you would need to en enter all of the fields. All the fields there are required because we need to know what CARC, what RAC, and what group codes you want added. And then we move forward to your actual submitter information. The website does nicely populate the date for you. 
But here you would just enter the demographic information, and I'm going to go ahead and do that for myself. Excuse me. And once you have entered this demographic information, you will receive your link. Note that you are required to submit your email address twice. There, the survey is connected, your link to part two is connected to a single email address. We want to emphasize this because it may be that you are working on your organization submission as a team. However, one individual will need to register and receive the link to part two. This same email address is also where any email acknowledgments, all email acknowledgments for submissions will be received. So we just want to emphasize that there is a single email address that the entire survey process will be tied to. You may want to consider, for example, creating a 2015 MBR submission specific email address that can be entered here. I'm just going to go ahead and finish entering this so that you can see the next page. You are asked to provide your stakeholder type, whether or not you're a core participant. The survey, again, is open to non-core participants that create or use the HIPAA mandated transactions. So I'll go ahead and say that you do use the transactions. And we'll be, you will be asked if you have completed a training, as we feel that um, attending this training or reviewing the materials that will be available on the CQH Core website is important in terms of preparing for your submission. Once you have hit next and the survey has processed, you will see this alert that you will receive an email to that will include the, all of the data that you submitted in part one, as well as your link to part two of the survey. So we're just going to go ahead and show you an example so that you can see what that email will look like. So here is the email that you will receive. It will detail the information that you submitted in the prior example and include the link that is tied to your email address that you must use to enter submissions in part two of the survey. If you click on this link, it will take you directly here. So when the link to part two opens, it opens on this navigation page. This page serves as your home base for entering potential adjustments that you wish to be considered. For all adjustments, you are required to start with the scenario to which you want the adjustment applied. So if I want to add CARC 275 to business scenario number three, I would select business scenario number three. Likewise, if I want to remove a CARC from business scenario number three, or I want a code combination relocated to a business scenario, I start with the scenario. Let's go ahead and just use business scenario number one for our example. This page appears exactly this manner for regardless of which business scenario you select. So once you select a business scenario, it will take you to the page for potential adjustments. Again, there are three types of adjustments, addition, removal, and relocation. And from here, you can select which adjustment you want to apply. We're going to walk through um, an example of each, focusing on the adjustments that we received uh, most frequently via the 2014 survey. So in 2014, we found that about 97% of our requests related to either adding or removing a, a RARC. So we're going to focus on those. That appears to be where the business needs are. Let's start with adding a RARC, a car, I'm sorry, adding a RARC to an existing CARC. So if you feel that, for example, we have a core required CARC that currently has a RARC that you have experienced a lot of usage for but is not in the business scenario, this would be where you add that adjustment. 
So we'll say that we want to add our MA30 to CARP 250 in business scenario three. This scenario number one, excuse me. So go ahead and do that. You will be required to select all of the group codes that will apply. We'll add a couple of those. Note also that all of the fields on this page are mandatory. So you are required so that we can properly apply your adjustment if approved to provide the RARC number, the CARC number, and all of the applicable group codes. So for example, no group codes were selected, you would not be able to move forward. If we completed everything accurately, I'll click Next. The next page, Section 3B, asks that you evaluate or you assess your submission against the core code combination and evaluation criteria. So the core participants did establish a set of criteria that are used to assess all potential adjustments to the core code combination. So this section of the survey asks that to ensure that all potential adjustments are valid, they have been vetted against the core code combinations criteria. We have some criteria that are basically irrefutable. So all submissions must meet these first five criteria listed. We do require that a CARC be in only one core defined business scenario, that CARCs that require a rock star definition have one included, um, and for CARCs that they not be deactivated, and for rocks they not be alert rocks or deactivated. And then there's some criteria that may or may not apply to your submission. So for example, were we adding a CARC without a RARC, RARC definition as official specificity would not apply. So after carefully reviewing the criteria and carefully looking at your code combination adjustments, you are asked to describe how your adjustment meets these criteria. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, you may have a CARC that has been, that is required in business scenario number three, and you've had a RARC, let's say, that talks about the missing information in the CARC, but we don't currently have it in the business scenario, and you have high usage of it, so you feel that this should be associated with the existing CARC in the existing business scenario. So we'll just put some things in, because this field is mandatory, so you cannot move forward if it is empty. But for the purposes of this demo, we'll just put some text in so that we can move forward. The next part of the survey for your code combination submission asks that you demonstrate and explain the business case for the adjustment. So part of the task group's maintenance of the core code combination requires that potential market-based adjustments do have a strong business case. So we want to make sure that we meet our goal of having a nimble but refined and streamlined set of code combinations. We want to make sure that there's a strong business case for our adjustment. So this section here asks you to outline the business case. Does it apply to all organizations, or is it just something that you've experienced? Um, what do we expect the outcomes to be? Will we have improved billing, quicker posting, less staff time on follow-up and in remediation, et cetera? And we also ask you to describe the business need. So why is it that we need to add this code combination, or why is it that we need to remove this code combination if it already exists? Again, all of these fields are mandatory. So for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to put in some sample responses so that we can move forward. And then finally, we come to the section on real-world usage data. As Bob mentioned, real-world usage data can strongly support the business case for a code combination adjustment. And when we speak of real-world usage data, we're really talking about the code combinations that you have experienced and used, let's say, in the past year of usage of the, of the A35 and the Carson Marks and the core code combinations. So maybe in the past seven months, if you look back at your claims data, you didn't actually, your claim adjudication data, you never 
found a use for a specific code combination that's in core defined business scenario number three. Or you did find a use for it and you found it to be very confusing as a provider. You did not know how to properly remediate to address that code combination. So that, those are the kind of things that you would go into your system and find data that you can provide to the task group to help inform them when they are evaluating your potential adjustment. Again, I want to emphasize that this data is discretionary. We do understand that um, not all, organ all organizations may have ready access to the data, but it does very much support the business case. It is very useful. So if you do not have access to this data, you um, can definitely still submit a potential adjustment. You would just select here, no, we, don't, we do not have this data, and you would be sent back to the navigation page. For the purposes of this demo, I will say, yes, we do have the available data. And this will take you to the next page where you can input it. So in terms of the data, we do ask some um, kind of background questions. So what is the time frame of the data reviewed? So let's say I looked at six months of data from June to November or what have you. How much of your remittance is your claim data did you look at? These are exclusive, are exclusive, so it's either my remittance data or my claim data. And then we describe a summary of our analysis. So as the example there, you can see, for example, we looked at 20 payment cycles, and we found that this code combination occurred 1,000 times, and let's say that's 90% of our ERAs, and um, we really feel that needs to be added, et cetera. So that's the kind of case that you want to provide in this real-world real, real world usage data section. So once you've completed that, again, it is mandatory, so you have to enter some data there to get move forward. You hit Next, and your submission is complete. You will be redirected to the navigation page, where you can select either the same business scenario or perhaps a different business scenario that you want to walk, work, work through to complete additional submissions. So what I will do now is give you two more examples. We'll do an example of a removal, an example of a relocation, just to show you that the supporting sections, the evaluation criteria, business case, et cetera, are very much the same, and the process is very much the same. Let's move into business scenario number two. Let's do a removal. So this time we want to remove a car work that my health plan organization has found has, is not very useful and my provider organization finds to be confusing. So let's remove this work from business scenario number two. So again, mandatory field to enter the codes, the RARC and the CARC that we want removed. We do not need to identify the group codes because if we're removing a RARC, we will remove all applicable group codes. The entire code combination will be removed from the code combinations. Again, we are asked to evaluate the removal against the color code combination criteria and explain why it is that the core code combination that we want removed does not meet the existing criteria. Again, mandatory. And then this time we need to give a business case similar to what we did for the addition for why this removal is needed. Does it apply to the entire industry? Ideally, yes, it does. And then what will be improved by removing this? Perhaps we can say it's quicker posting, or we'll have reduced calls for information, et cetera. And then again, we describe this time the business needs specific to the removal. And after we've done that, we again come to the discretionary role of research data, which in the interest of the demo, we will just hit next, which takes you back to our navigation page. And then finally, we want to show a relocation because the process for this is just a slightly bit different than on the first page. So once we choose the business scenario that we want to relocate the 
cold combination from. We say that we're doing a relocation. So again, you select the business scenario from which you want the code combination moved. Let's say I want to move car 250 from business scenario number three and add it to business scenario number four. By select removal, remove cart and all associated work. I will be asked to provide the cart I want removed and identify the business scenario that I want it moved to. Note that there is a drop-down list available, and the drop-down list does not include the business scenario in which you are currently working. So there is some kind of a fail-safe to prevent requests to remove a business scenario and move it to the same business scenario. So that said, I think we'll need to finish up this example, noting that we have to complete all required forms. We have the same criteria that we must assess. We have similar criteria excuse me, that we must assess for the relocation. We have the same questions of explaining does the, mod the adjustment apply to your entire organization, to other organizations, and what are the expected outcomes. Again, you want to explain the business need. So for example, does the code combination better reflect a build service that is um, not separately playable than a build server that is not build services that is not covered, hence it belongs in business scenario number four and not business scenario number three. And finally, again, we would provide, if we have it, the discretionary real-world usage data that supports our business case. In the interest of time, again, we will proceed straight back to the navigation page. And finally, the navigation page is also your home base for deleting a submission that you um, have previously made. And that's quite simple. You go down to the delete a previous entry option, where you will be provided a drop-down list of all of the submissions that you have entered. This drop-down list identifies the submissions by the ID for each submission. So for each submission, you will receive an email acknowledgement. It contains the detailed information regarding the adjustment you submitted and its entry ID. You can use that email acknowledgement to identify an entry for deletion. Or you can identify the entry, as you can see here, by its specific code combination. So this entry is CARP 270, WARP MA30, and group codes PI and PR. Once you've selected the entry that you want deleted, you simply hit Next. It is deleted, and you are directed back to the navigation page. I think with that, we can return back to our actual presentation. And when we're all done, we can click Finish Survey which will submit your final response to the AQH core. Thank you very much, Ami. Again, if you need any help when you're filling out your surveys, please do not hesitate to reach out to core at caqh.org. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and switch in back into our PowerPoint and into our second and final polling question of the day. We are asking, if you are planning on completing the MBR industry survey, how many adjustments will your organization submit? Um, we're going to go ahead and give you, again, about 30 to 40 seconds. Um, once you have completed, I'm going to go ahead and share the results. So we'll go ahead and launch that now.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and close that survey. You can see some of the results here uh, asking if your organization intends to submit um, a response. Has your team already planned to develop your response or started uh, an internal planning? Um, it looks like some of you are underway. Um, some of you are uh, needing more information, and uh, a large majority or a large portion of you still uh, say no. So again, I'll go back to my previous comment, and, and please do not hesitate to reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Um, we want to try to make ourselves available and, uh, and respond to you as quickly as possible, because this is an important process, and your uh, input is uh, of vital importance. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hide those results and move on to the um, question and answer portion of, excuse me, we're going to move back to Omni to the uh, best practices um, for this afternoon. Omni, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Tyler. So that said, it's great to hear that um, some individuals have got, gotten started, but we can definitely address those who need more information. Please, again, do email us at core, C-O-R-E, at chuh.org. Um, we do have, we have heard, for example, um, in recent some months that there are, was a provider that had just one code they wanted modified, and we definitely want to be able to accommodate if you have one change or 50 changes, being able to do that. So please do contact us. So again, as an overall summary of the process, the survey is a two-part survey. With part one, you access the, uh, the general link in this presentation or on the website. And when you register there with your demographic information, you receive a unique organization-specific link that will take you to part two, where you can submit all of your individual adjustments as we just walked through, whether that be one or 100. So we do want to before we go into the Q&A, offer some quick best practices for um, moving forward with your response to the industry survey. Again, as a reminder, the, host, the industry survey does requ require use of a single email address. Um, it is important that this email address be something that is probably accessible by more than one individual in the industry, I mean, in the organization, excuse me, um, because people do go out of the office, they might you take unexpected leave on February 9th and the survey closes February 10th, what have you. So we do suggest, if possible, create a sure shared email address that can be used. We have had organizations create, you know, code combo survey at, I'm going to use CAQH because I work here, at CAQH.org, for example, and then that one inbox is accessible by every. Hey, I, mean, I can no longer hear you from your location. Another suggestion that we have heard from previous submitters is creating a detailed spreadsheet sheet of your submissions. The pre-work to complete some adjust to complete your list of recommended adjustments. Um, there is some pre-work involved there. So what we think is probably best is create a spreadsheet of all of your submissions, do all of that work ahead of time, detail it in this document, and then spend a few hours sitting down actually inputting them into the online survey. That spreadsheet will also be easy for you if you want to go back and edit a submit submission or delete one. You'll have a cleaner reference point if you have a spreadsheet that lists everything that you um, have inputted. For the deletion, we do recommend that, as I mentioned, the deletions are identified by their entity, their entry ID. The entry ID is a, will be in the email acknowledgement you receive for each submission. So you can look at them that way just by the entry ID. If you're using a spreadsheet for your submissions, it would also be um, a good idea to enter that entry ID. So you have a column for entry ID, and once you've entered them, 
you can go back in and put that populate that entry ID column. That's useful as we do have in the past. Uh, we have had in the past that individuals have had to go back and um, delete a entry at a later date, and then you have to, rather than having to weed through many emails, you can just go back and go to your spreadsheet to find the entry ID for the deletion. And then finally, for the real world usage data, it may be that you are not on the team or on the side of the house that has access to that data. You might want to start thinking ahead and contacting individuals on that side of the house and try to get that team involved in your submission. Again, the real world usage data is discretionary. However, it definitely can help in providing the business case and the business need for your adjustment. Well, that finally, as I mentioned, we do have several additional resources that are available to assist in completing the industry survey. Again, all of the core staff, we are definitely a resource to you, and we're already willing to help, so reach out to us. There is also a detailed instructions document um, that is a companion document to the online survey. So in addition to the instructions in section one, there's this additional instructions document that can be useful. It includes some of the FAQs that are specific to the industry survey so that you can have an easy reference point to those by going on the CAQH website. We do have, as I mentioned, mentioned a sample version of the complete industry survey. It includes an example for each of the addition, removal, and relocation, as well as all of the other information in part, parts one and two. So it's definitely important to consult that document before you go into the online survey. And it'll also show you, the, as we walk through today in the demo, what the survey looks like. For anyone who was not on this, able to attend today's training, or in case you want it to look back at the information from this training, we will have the recording and the materials available on the CAQH website. If you noted, um, in part one, we had a question about whether or not you attended the training. Uh, we did think that the training was useful information and would be um, important for before completing the survey. So you obviously have attended this training, but if there are other team members um, who will be working on this, it might be a great idea to direct them to these materials. And again, if you have any additional questions or concerns or want to know if something constitutes substantial adjustment or whatever, please do contact us at core at caqh.org. And with that, I would like to hand it off to Jeffrey Jessica to lead our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omni. And also, thank you so much, Bob, for your presentations. <laughs> and it looks like we do have some time for questions. Please submit your questions by typing them into the questions panel of your dashboard. And again, <clears throat> excuse me, please identify your type of organization so we can better and more accurately respond. So we do have some questions. Um, I believe this uh, first question is for Omni. The question is, uh, how will I know if my submissions were successfully inputted? Great. Thanks, Jessica. That's a great question. So for each adjust, potential adjustment that you submit via the online survey, you will receive an email acknowledgement to the email address that was inputted in part one. And that email acknowledgement will include all of the information that you submitted for the adjustment. So it's also a good way to check that you correctly entered your, the information, you put in the right codes, the right business rationale, business case criteria, et cetera. And it will include the entry ID for that submission, so that if you want to go back and modify that entry, you will have the entry ID. Thank you so much, Omni. The next question, I, I believe, is for Bob. The question is, could you give an example of what is meant by real-world usage data? Yes, Jessica. I think that um, it's a really important question because the real-world usage data, um, although it's discretionary, you don't have to include it on your submission, um, it's really helpful for the task group when they receive that type of information um, as they evaluate and analyze your submission. So if you are having a particular problem with a code combination, um, let's say you as a provider keep receiving it in almost every time, you can't really understand it, you have to call um, the health plan or you have to go check out the latest notice on their uh, website and it stops you from auto posting um, and that type of uh, example where you're having a problem is really important and really helpful 
So anytime you can share that type of problem, um, how many times it occurs, uh, how often, uh, from how many health plans, uh, the volume of those, that type of real world usage is really, really important. Um, another example from perhaps a health plan perspective, let's say you generate your 835s and this particular code combination, uh, you really would like to have it added to the core code combination set. Well, to have it added, it would be great if you could include information like how frequently you expect to include this code combination. What percent of your ERAs or your 835s would this code combination appear on? How many providers would be impacted by receiving this? Um, what percentages? So numbers, that kind of raw data can be very helpful as the task group evaluates your submission. Thanks, Bob. Um, the next question is for Omni. Uh, the question is, what are the next steps after the MBR closes? Great, that's a great question. So after the MBR closes in February, the adjustments are given to the task group, and it's time for their work to review them and evaluate them and determine whether or not they should be applied to the core code combination. So that work will occur from basically March through the end of May, and then any approved adjustments will be incorporated into the updated version of the core code combination that is published in early June of next year. Thanks, Omni. We've got another question coming in, and I believe this one is for Bob. The question is, how much time does it take to prepare and to complete a submission? Hey, Bob, we can't hear you. Apologies. Uh, another good question. I think that any time that you are planning to submit um, an entry, on the market-based review. You want to make sure you give yourself about 15 to 20 minutes per submission. That way, as you are uh, combing through your code combination, you're able to select the criteria that best suits uh, the submission type. You're able to um, evaluate that code combination. You'll be able to data enter your real-world usage data. Um, so about 15 to 20 minutes is a good rule of thumb for each entry. And then if you want to plan that out because you may have three entries or you may have 15. So it may take a little bit longer than you expect if you have a high volume, but sometimes in some of the tips and uh, that Omni provided, if you uh, plan that out through the use of a spreadsheet or through use of uh, a tool and use cut and paste, it can really help uh, kind of reduce that time frame as well. Thanks, uh, Bob. Um, I believe the next question is from me. What do I do if I have technical problems during submission? Sure, that's a good question. If you do run into any problems, do please email us directly at core, C-O-R-E, at the AQH.org, and we will be able to help you remediate those. Um, we are, we like to be very responsive, so if you run into an issue, do reach out to us, and we're happy to help. That's good to know, Omni. Thank you so much. And then we have one final question for Bob. Uh, my organization has a potential new business scenario. When can I submit that? New business scenarios can be submitted in the 2016 market-based review. So not this year, not through this market base, but through our next one. And that's really because we want to allow the, the task group once you evaluate the process and ensure that that process meets both the industry needs as well as um, the needs of all the organizations um, to make sure that it's a, a regulatory uh, approach, if that's what's going to be required to ensure that it becomes part of a mandated set of, of uh, core code combinations. Um, so we're going to spend part of the year uh, evaluating the process and then ensure that that process is in place for uh, the 2016 market-based review. Thanks so much, Bob. And it looks like we are out of time for questions. Um, I would like to thank our speakers and also thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. If you have further questions or are interested in any more of our topics or work, or if you have ideas for future le learning sessions, please go to our website or email us at uh, core at caqh.org. And don't forget that a recording of this session will be available on our website in the next 24 hours. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day.